Hello, everyone. My name is Darla Saunders, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Ben Whalen of the Kennebecasis Watershed Restoration Committee. Ben has been the project manager of the Kennebecasis Watershed Restoration Committee since 2007 and has led the organization through many projects. As a father, angler, and active community member, he understands the need to create win-win situations so effective watershed improvements can be accomplished. Under his management, the KWRC has increased staffing capacity while enhancing more than 5,000 meters of riparian stream bank implementing stormwater awareness programs, initiating invasive species monitoring, creating a weekly watershed walk channel, and many more exciting projects. After this afternoon's presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session. I'll now turn the webinar over to Ben. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Darla. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come out today and uh, present, uh, actually kind of kick off our riparian restoration manual. I'm going to get into and introduce the manual to everybody, but first, before I do that, I kind of want to introduce uh, the Kennedy Cases Watershed Restoration Committee, uh, give you a little bit of a background as to, you know, why we feel that we can present this manual, why we can develop this manual with some level of confidence. Uh, the KWRC uh, originally started off as the Trow Creek Model Watershed back in 1994. Um, you know, and since that time, we've undertaken over 50 restoration or riparian restoration uh, enhancement projects, and, and we have what we call our restoration site bios, um, and you can find those on our website, and I won't get into all of those. Um, you know, we've, in 1994, when we got our start, uh, the first thing that we did was assess 280 kilometers of our stream. The key findings of that study resulted in finding out that elevated stream temperatures and degraded riparian zones, which we all know are pretty tightly linked, but they are the two key limiting factors to the overall health of our watershed. Uh, it, we come from mainly an agricultural watershed. Over 20% of our watershed is impacted by agricultural stakeholders, but those stakeholders are the same people or the, the majority of the people that we engage and work with to accomplish our riparian restoration work. Um, what we wanted to do, or over time, as we develop more and more projects, we were getting a lot of calls, uh, a lot of people interested in some of the activities that we were doing. And I would spend a lot of time on the phone networking and, and doing a lot of different work, just kind of telling people, here's what we do, here's how we do it. And as a nonprofit organization, we spent a lot of that time not getting paid doing that work. And we felt that, you know, or I guess as a staff, we sat down and said, what can we do to generate some compensation for this knowledge that we have? So I'm going to kind of introduce a little bit of that today, introduce you to the overall riparian restoration manual, walk you through the manual, and uh, if there's any questions, feel free to ask some questions. So I'm just going to take a second, uh, stop sharing my camera here, and uh, get into the slideshow. At least I hope that goes. All right, so I'm hoping everybody can see that. If not, maybe just message Darla, and Darla, you can just interject and uh, let me know if there's any problems or, or not. Uh, so again, my name is Ben Whalen. I'm the project manager of the Kennedy Case Watershed. I've been in this position since October of 2007, so longer probably than I care to admit. I'm getting older than I care to admit, but I think with age comes experience. And so we feel that uh, with that experience, we can you know, readily uh, put the, this information out here. Uh, so a quick presentation overview. Uh, these are just, again, I'm going to keep the PowerPoint to a minimum. Um, you know, I can bore you and go through slides, but we've all seen slides. And I really think the key for this is the riparian restoration toolbox itself. And I'll walk you through that. But so just why, the who, the what, and the where type of thing is, is the overall PowerPoint. So why create the manual? Um, well, obviously to get paid, duh. I mean, that not that the goal of every nonprofit organization is to try to find ways to tap into funding sources and that kind of thing? Well, for us, this was one of those ways that we could do that. And as I alluded to in the introduction, uh, it was one of the key drivers. We were spending a lot of time talking to people uh, without getting compensated for that experience or that professionalism that we were trying to share. So we thought, let's try to go after some some funding to, to do that. Um, it's, you know, it says that I'm tired of giving out free information over and over again. I, I never tire of talking about what it is that I do. I'm passionate about what it is that I do. But my committee was, you know, 
thinking, Ben, you've got to find a way to, to, to monetize this so that we can create some sustainability amongst our organization. The other thing was we wanted to make sure that we were always giving out the same information. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, when you tell a story over and over again, you either tend to exaggerate it or downplay it, depending on who you're talking to, that kind of thing. By putting it into a shareable document, we do feel that it's an opportunity for us to make sure that it's consistent over and over again, that I'm always giving out the same information to those people that are interested. Um, so yeah, and then long distance phone calls obviously cost money. So when I have to return a phone call or anything like that, that costs money. Now instead, I just share it via email. And to be perfectly honest, with technology nowadays, it's getting easier and easier to share these online folders, even these large folders, because this is a fairly large document. So it, you know, it, 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 we've come a long ways in being able to do that. Um, and then the other thing is to get groups started on riparian restoration work. Riparian restoration work as a whole can be kind of daunting when you look at it from, oh, well, I don't know where to start. Uh, you know, I don't want to get myself into trouble. What do I require? What are all the needs? Who should I talk to? That kind of thing. And uh, we wanted to remove that intimidation factor. Um, this document isn't perfect. This is the way that we do it. And for some groups, it's going to change. But what we really wanted to show people is, look, you can do this. It's not necessarily rocket science there are some things that are very technical where you might need some help but here's how to, to start down that pathway anyway so it's really a beginning document uh, so who's manual for fledgling watershed organizations was really our key target or established organizations with staff new staff if your organizations like the Kennedy cases watershed you'll tend to have a lot of staff turnover especially season to season uh, restoration season to restoration season and we were looking for a way to, you know, a document that here, uh, the first couple of days your staff are here, a lot of it is reading and, and getting to know the organization and getting to know the other people and getting to know all the processes that, that you follow on a day-to-day -day basis. This manual can be one of those documents that you can put in front of a new summer student and say, here's where we're heading in, in, you know, 2022 and this is some of the work that we're going to undertake and here's the sections that you should read on this. The other groups that might be interested are fish and game organizations. Uh, our municipal partners are, have shown an interest in this as well. So they can give it to their either their counselors so that their counselors understand how our, our organization works and operates and some of the projects that we can do. And why that's important is because those municipal counselors can make decisions on funding towards our organization later on. So if they have this manual in front of them and say, holy crap, they do a lot of work. Uh, you know, it's worth it for us to give them, you know, 25, 5,000 bucks type of thing. Uh, and we use our municipal funds to leverage off other funding. So it's important that, you know, if you're going to take this and maybe put a, you know, include your group's uh, email on as well and say, here's something similar that we do, or take the pieces out of this that are going to be important to you and hand it over to your municipal partners as well. And then obviously the other uh, target audience are individuals seeking to improve local waterways. So if you're just a, an individual homeowner and you're, you've got a problem and you've identified that problem and you're looking for something that you can do on your own waterway, uh, maybe you can take this manual and look through it and say, hey man, that looks really good. Or where I would encourage the individuals is to partner with their local watershed group. But if you have this document going to your watershed group, maybe you can help them go down that right path as well. And obviously it's for anybody. Uh, this, doc this document's for everyone who might have an interest in watershed management. So when I say others, that would be the others that uh, that, uh, that we're referring to. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is for everyone. What's in the manual? Obviously the best way to, to really discuss this topic is to go through the manual page by page. And, and I'm gonna do that here in a minute, but just overall from, uh, from 30,000 feet, uh, we break down our work here at the Cannabis Cases Watershed to three main pillars. Uh, I organize our funding proposals, our reporting, our finances, and everything are, are based around three main pillars here. The first one is education and outreach. Uh, the second one is monitoring and research. And then the third one is restoration work. Um, and restoration or stewardship, we could say as well. Uh, under outreach, um, some of the things that we discussed in the manual are event hosting and in-kind tracking. I mean, we think that that's really important and sometimes a piece that's overlooked. One of the assets that watershed organizations bring to their local communities or their local area is the opportunity to provide people with, you know, a chance to get out and plant trees or do some watershed monitoring and that kind of thing. But as an organization that's taking care of this and organizing this stuff, 
uh, that has to report back to our funding partners, it's really important that we track our in-kind contributions and those values of that in-kind contribution so that we can leverage it later on down the road. And within the manual, we talk about this and provide some of the, uh, you know, some of the forms that we use. And again, the forms that we use can be used or altered by any organization so that it fits your, what your specific needs are. But we just give you a good thought process as to, you know, how to take those steps and how to get started. Uh, obviously, another key component of our work here is monitoring. And uh, I got to be honest, we're known mainly as a, as a restoration organization, but our monitoring and research has really started to take off as well. Um, and we've really developed a lot of field sheets and templates and methodologies. Uh, and it's become a little bit complicated for me as a, as the loan project manager here to to train the staff every year and make sure that you know they've got all the stuff that they need. So this manual is going to hopefully make that much simpler and much easier for us long term. And then restoration again that there's a lot of technical stuff that can take place within a restoration project and in a restoration site uh, whether it's in, in the pre-planning or the actual carrying out of those activities and we've done our best within this manual to kind of talk about what some of those things might be um, and including a lot of discussion on uh, what in new brunswick the wetland and watercourse alteration permit um, and with that i should well i'll wait until we get into the restoration aspect to talk about the permitting because Obviously, there's a lot of variation depending on where you're coming from. So before I go too much further, I just want to put this up there and I'll leave it there for a second. And I, and I do think that Darla is recording this presentation. So uh, you should be able to get this if you don't get a chance to write this down. Uh, this is my contact information, uh, ben.whalen at kennebycasesriver.org. And for those of you folks that might uh, already think they have my contact information or my email down, we did just go through a, a website restructuring and took on the .org on our email. Uh, so just make sure that you've got that change. Um, it is cannabicasesriver.org now. Um, our hashtag uh, is worth wading into. And this year, we, our, our, our goal or our, our mission statement for this year is a little bit different in the fact that uh, it's protect and connect. Uh, so we're also using protect and connect, hashtag protect and connect for this year. And there's our website as well, cannabicasesriver.org. Um, a lot of the manual um, next next week, I believe, or no, uh, Earth Day is March 22nd, or World Water Day is March 22nd. And we're going to be using that date to kick off this repair and restoration manual, kicking everything live. We'll be doing a lead up to that. And uh, at that time, everything is going to be available through our website and we'll be doing some social media posting as well. So you guys are getting a bit of a preview of the manual today and I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. So without a whole lot more, I'm going to kind of tend to walk you through the email. Sorry, I just got an email in my inbox there. I'm going to take an opportunity to walk you through the manual a little bit. Um, I hope I don't go too fast and I hope I cover off some of the key important issues. Again, if there's something, if I kind of skim over something and you see it as we're going through the manual, feel free to kind of message out to Darla and uh, and let her know and maybe I can get a chance to, to return to that piece later on. So if you just give me a second here, I'm just gonna switch documents. And I'll try to make sure that everybody can see that art. Hopefully the font's gonna be a little bit small at this scope, but that, there's the title page. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like. Our goal was to kind of keep it simple. Uh, we did do this in-house um, using about uh, three to four different staff people who helped organize it and one person under contract to help with some of the overall organization or the final organization of the document as a whole. Um, and again, most of that was under my supervision and using my experience uh, to really kind of shore up some of the restoration activities. And then I'm going to scroll in a little bit so that it comes in a little clearer as I scroll through it. You'll notice that in the table of contents, we didn't include any pages. Instead, what we've done is done by sections. So section one and then one one. The reason why we did it that way is we feel that this is going to be a living document. We're going to be adding pieces on here and taking pieces out at times once if something has to change. So instead of putting page numbers, which you then have to alter every time, we're just going to leave it as section numbers and go from there. The other reason for that is, is that each page that we've got in here is hopefully uh, a standalone document. Not hopefully, it is a standalone document. If you were to just print off one section and hand it over to somebody, they could use that section just for that specific topic. Um, so you can see, again, community outreach, monitoring, 
and there's our restoration. And so those are three pillars and each section is done accordingly. Um, you may think uh, there are some things under the monitoring that maybe you think, well, oh, that's not really a monitoring task. Why isn't that under restoration? And there are some things that are, there's one in particular under the restoration that I think, why isn't that under the monitoring? And under community outreach, um, you know, how to monitor precipitation for cocoa RAS. Well, why isn't that under monitoring? Well, it's the way we break it down here local, within our organization and monitoring precipitation through cocoa RAS. And if you're not familiar with cocoa RAS, let's scroll down to cocoa RAS here. Um, actually, I'll wait to go to cocoa RAS. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, so we did do an introduction. Uh, it walks you through what the document is about, who the manual is for, kind of what I've already gone through with you folks already. Um, and talks a little bit about, you know, some of the organizations that are, are, are involved in this and again, the three pillars that we're, that we're trying to highlight. And then it does talk about some of the supporters for the manual. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, six other groups on this project, the Hammond River Angling Association, ACAP St. John, the Blah Watershed, the Ormukto River Watershed, the Canaan Washed Mohawk Watershed, and then the Nashwalk Watershed as well. Um, funding supporters obviously are important for any project for nonprofits, and we really appreciate the opportunity from the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation to present this. But and overall, they weren't a funding partner of the original um, uh, the original riparian restoration manual, so they didn't get their name on the cover. But definitely, they they've stepped up as an important partner to help us get that message out there. But Environment and Climate Change Canada through the Atlantic Ecosystem Initiative grant was a huge supporter. New Brunswick uh, government obviously through the Environmental Trust Fund. The New Brunswick Wildlife Trust Fund and our local fish and game association, Sussex Fish and Game, are all huge partners. And of course, I got to take the time to talk about them and let everybody know. So thank you for bearing with me on that. Um, so the first section is community outreach. And again, what you see here is just, you know, the following section contains watershed related activities. Uh, we really pride ourselves here at the KWRC in creating win win scenarios. Uh, the picture that you see there is our staff working with a local. Uh, summer camp at the Nutrient Civic Center. So that's our local indoor pool and gym. Um, they care, they completed or they host a summer camp and they also had an, a need for a rain garden. So we work with them to design and implement a rain garden and then use their summer camp students to plant the rain garden. Uh, we bought the plants, but we use the in-kind contribution from that organization to you know help facilitate some of that effort. And that's important. And that's kind of the thing that we're trying to address here within our community outreach section of this manual. Uh, talking to people is important. We often build networks and, and try to create relationships and those relationships are important as well. And here in this picture as well, you'll see a sign. We feel that signage and branding is important as well. Uh, and we've worked hard to try to create a bit of a brand. And you see us talking, or, or that's actually myself sitting there talking to two representatives from Fisheries and Oceans and a representative from Ag, Ag Canada on one of our riparian restoration sites. Um, so I talked a little bit about, you know, we have templates. We want to try to create templates for you folks to take a look at. Uh, so each section is broke up just like this, or each uh, each component is, like, you know, here's 1.1, how to, everything will have that how to banner at the top. And then the next section is host a great Canadian shoreline cleanup. Uh, again, this is our event that we use for shoreline cleanups. There are other models around depending on where you're coming from. Um, we feel that by contributing to a, because the great Canadian shoreline cleanup is a federal or, or a federal effort, uh, our data goes into that federal database and we feel that it they, they provide some really good um, you know, promotional material and promotional support for us as well. So it really works out for us to, to go through the great Canadian shoreline cleanup model. But again, I encourage you as you go through this manual, look at your own organization, look at your own current partnerships, maybe if you have some or you know, local businesses and stuff that are there and see if you can maybe create a better model for yourself. And the real information on this is how to track and how to create you know, those partnerships and, and generate donations and using donation letters to your local grocery stores and stuff like that. We haven't paid for barbecue or to host uh, a Great Canadian Shoreline cleanup in quite some time. It almost runs on its own now. We just send out the letters and get the organizers. We get our local waste hauler in play and we get our local transfer station. We don't actually have a, um, you know, what they, the typical dump or your, your waste management facility. We don't actually have one of those here. It goes to a transfer station that goes off to another region for, for a proper disposal. But all that's paid for through the local waste hauler here. So 
though that kind of information can be found within these within this document um we talk about registration processes a little bit then each each section has a materials required uh this one isn't really um you know overly inclusive it talks a little bit about you know hey if you're going to do this you'll need tables and barbecue and coolers some of the other stuff you'll see but each section will have that materials required um so as a disclaimer on the materials required it's not meant to be inclusive we, it, we, we've tried to identify everything that we typically throw in there or everything that we have and it can act as a checklist for you as you go through or as your crew is preparing to go to a restoration site uh hopefully they'll you know check shovels check uh, rakes check grassy check uh silk fencing check all that stuff will hopefully be there for you to go through Here's the other aspect where the where the manual is really valuable, we think, is there's an event registration form. And this can act as a template. Again, all these templates that we put on there have our logo on there because we don't want you necessarily just printing it off and not giving us any credit. But feel free to take this these templates, um, you know, change them up the way you see fit, and then use them for yourselves. So I talked about COCORAS. There's the COCORAS. Now, COCORAS is Community Collaborative Rain and Hail and Snow Monitoring Network. It's actually a network of volunteers uh, that enter data on a uh, national level. Um, actually, it's it's global. Uh, there are COCORAS volunteers pretty much across the globe. Uh, we recruit local volunteers for COCORAS here in our watershed. What we're trying to do is just to increase the number of rain gauges that we have in our watershed so that we can get a better idea of where rain falls, that kind of thing, so we can maybe do some better flow modeling later on. Um, I won't get into that one too, too much. Again, there's materials needed. Uh, tools needed um, and then a lot of our sections too will have additional information um, again part of the reason why we haven't made this an actual printed hard copy um, or it's not going to be available through a printed hard copy is links and stuff tend to change quite frequently so uh, we're going to try to keep up to date as often as possible on these links and it's much easier to change them simply on the digital document versus on a printed document type of thing I don't want to print off 20 documents it's a 160 page document so i don't or 120 page document i don't want to print off 120 pages and all of a sudden i've got to change 14 pages because the websites are out that just doesn't work so what we're going to do is leave it mainly as a digital document and change it when we have to uh talk about how to publicize an event so again one of the things that we have to teach our staff or especially our communication staff here when they turn over um, is you know how to do a press release and how to contact the local papers and uh, how to reach out to our or how to do our social media posting and that kind of thing so we just have a quick one pager um, it's not inclusive again it, there's a lot of information that isn't looked at here we don't go into huge detail but we start you down that path so that you can start to um, get an idea of what is needed uh, simple things like creating a hashtag for yourself and you can see on the graphic that I have there and I'll pull it in a little bit maybe for you so you can see a little better. Um, this is just a, an example of one of our social media posts and we have hashtag worth wading into. Another one that's used here in New Brunswick and so if you're listening to, to us from New Brunswick today, uh, OMB Water. Um, there's a watershed caucus that works across the province and that is the um, hashtag that they use so that we can follow each other as well. And so if you're coming at us from another region and your region doesn't have a you know, a hashtag for your watershed groups or for your conservation organizations or whatever whatever it is that you're into. Something like that can help you track and follow the other organizations that you're partnered with so that you all know what's going on and, and you can share on in those successes. I'm gonna scroll back out here. And again, we talk a little bit about radio and then again, tracking. It's important to track all, all of your, you know, all your coverage. If you're, we have a form that, uh, I think it might even be here. Yeah, so photo release registration forms, event reg registration forms, press releases. Um, yeah, and then we also do a, a, a form here locally where we track our newspaper columns and, and how many times we end up in the local paper type of thing or on the local radio station. And it's important, that's important to report back to your funding partners. <coughs> just, excuse me just for a sec. So, Another important part for us is tracking our volunteer engagement. And I think this is one of those areas that sometimes gets overlooked by groups starting out. Um, track everything that you get, every volunteer that steps up, make sure that you're tracking what they're doing, how much time they're spending, and then put a cash value to that because you can really, um, you know, we come from a fairly small market, but we 
create about twelve thousand to fifteen thousand dollars annually that we can leverage an in-kind contribution back to our funding partner so we can take that twelve thousand and or let's say fifteen thousand just for the sake of math uh, we can take that fifteen thousand and grow it to thirty thousand so leverage another fifteen and then we take that thirty and leverage it to sixty type of thing and and it's important though if you're going to do that to track all that in-kind contribution that you have and that's the key reason for this page and again we have an engagement report templates and everything there for you uh, we also think that it's important for you to understand how to talk to landowners, make contact with landowners. So we did, and again, not necessarily all you folks, because some of you folks might be really adverse at this, but your summer staff coming in might need to know how to do that. So we, you know, we best practice in, connect, in connecting with landowners, and we and we we put that in here as well. And again, we're using somebody else's information here uh, for the most part, and and we we credit them for that. But it's important to understand how that works, and you know, because some restoration projects can be made or broke by the relationship that you have with the landowner, that whose land you're going to be possibly working on to do riparian enhancement work. Uh, and here's just a letter of understanding that we carry with landowners that we work with. Again, uh, this is just a template. The template's there. You can use that um, or create your own or, or you know, mo modernize your own for that. So that's education outreach, moving into monitoring. Again, our monitoring work helps create mandates and, and set mandates and also assess success of our past restoration efforts. Uh, obviously, we know that elevated stream temperatures are, are, you know, one of those things that we're trying to address. So we monitor to make sure that we're at least maintaining those stream temperatures, hopefully, and that indicates that our riparian improvement work is, is a success. And we can report that to our funding partners, and hopefully they'll continue to fund us so that we can continue to make those improvements. Uh, again, a bit of a background, and the how-tos. The how-tos and the monitoring are really a bit of our methodologies. Um, each section will start off with an introduction as to what the how-to is gonna talk about, uh, then talk about you know various technical aspects of those. I'm not going to get into all these on you because some of them are pretty extensive. Um, again, they're not all perfect. They've been adopted or adapted for what works for us in the field. You might find that something else works a little bit better. Something else might work a little bit cleaner depending on your own personal preference. Uh, but this, by putting it in this manual for us, it creates some consistency. Uh, and we think that uh, from, again, consistency from year to year and staff to staff because we have a lot of turnover our summer. We're geared as a, an organization that teaches students. We get maybe a summer student for one to two years and then they move on into their, you know, their more full-time or more permanent career. Uh, so we want to make sure that, that by giving them these documents, they can really step up and, and be consistent with what happened in the previous years. Uh, so again, we have some video linkages and stuff like that, again, across the manual. Uh, we're gonna try and work hard to keep those videos in check as well. Don't want to send you any place inappropriate. Um, and again, there's documentation, there's um, graphics and all of it, and, and and figures and stuff through all of it, some pictures uh, to talk about it to show some of the, you know better explain some of those things that are there. The materials required is still there, and a lot of that. And then we do talk a little bit too within our monitoring is how we use the data and whether that's to create a mandate or you know maybe it's just to um, inform our stakeholders. Uh, it, it, it's all useful as to how we use that data. Uh, stream flow sampling, again, we, we try to keep things simple as well. We are a nonprofit organization. And while some of this stuff can get really complicated, what we want to do is show you that you can do a lot of this stuff with a first time summer student who's been out once with the, you know a, a you know your manager or something somebody like that in the field and after the first time if they have this manual with them they can go through and get this done um again provided they have a little bit of know-how and, and a little bit of schooling so uh they can check off the materials required they can get that that's what i need and i'm off to the field and away i go Again, if they need some more information or want to know how to use the information, here's a, a link type of thing. And again, there's another field template. Um, this document or our riparian restoration manual under the monitoring, we have a couple of different ways in which we do assessment. And I don't know um, if everybody would, would be in the same kind of scenario. We have a habitat assessment, which we basically assess a full stream length possibly or full reach at least and then we actually have a site assessment they're very similar 
um, and, the, and what information is gathered, but the site assessment is meant for a specific property. It's what we use to actually inform our landowners after we do their, so this is our habitat assessment here. And then we have our site assessment. So when I go on to a landowner's property, the site assessment report actually is forwarded to him. And it also will include some of the recommendations that we might have to that landowner uh, so that he can improve his overall riparian uh, uh, status. And those two are pretty uh, important documents for us. And again, it's all explained there. The materials are there, all that. And again, here's the site assessment field sheet. Uh, this gets done. The bigger part of this for us is the notes, and you might customize your own notes. We actually include uh, some financials in here, so to talk to the landowner about where we're going to be going for um, funding and that kind of thing, and what it's going to cost us if we undertake this project on his behalf. Uh, we'll provide mapping as well, a lot of mapping and, and stuff like that. We didn't get into a lot of the mapping on the within this manual because that there's a lot of information on mapping um it may be something as the living document grows it may be something that we add later on uh, but right now we're not there we also do culvert assessments so we talk about our process there and again culvert assessment is pretty detailed uh, and the sheet looks really busy when i show you the sheet here it gets pretty busy so there's our culvert assessment field sheet um it is quite busy um, we found it important that were the staff at the time when we developed this sheet, they wanted it all on one page. They didn't want to have to flip through in multiple pages. So we really worked hard at trying to create a, a one page field document that they could fill out. Uh, and they then can bring it back into the office, put it into our database. And we actually have a, a, a prioritization document that we have. We didn't go into all the details on that only because we thought it would be too much at that time. Uh, and again, we're trying to keep it so that it doesn't intimidate people. We want to make it look simple and fairly simple. So with one sheet, it is fairly simple, but when you get into our prioritization, it is a little bit more complicated. If anybody wants information on that, feel free to reach out to me. But again, the template is what's important to you folks. And I think if you take a look at it, once you get out to the field, you can modernize it yourself or change it or edit it to meet your purposes when you're out there. Uh, water quality sampling, we work with the province of New Brunswick and we pretty much follow their protocols on water sampling or surface water sampling. So we just basically put that all in this document as well, again, because we wanted everything in one document or in one area. And again, that's their field sheet pretty much with our logo on top and you can do the same. So to move into the restoration, which is probably why a lot of you are here. Um, again, you look at our restoration pictures here. We put heavy machinery, uh, lots of rock material right next to the shoreline. Uh, probably the biggest thing that you have to be aware of is what are your permit requirements? Um, we address the permit requirements from a provincial standpoint, being in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, we work with and we have a good relationship with the Department of Environment Local Government's approvals branch. So I would encourage anybody after you go through this document, try to establish that same kind of relationship with your Department of Environment or your approvals branch, um, whoever that might be in your jurisdiction. Um, they're not, you know, they're not the evil people uh, that sometimes I think they get made out to be. Uh, they are willing to work with you, at least in our jurisdiction, they're willing to work with us and, you know, help us uh, through that permitting process. Obviously, we've got a 20 plus year history now with them as well. Uh, so they have some confidence in what, what it is that we're going to put forward. I'd encourage you if you're going to put in a, uh, a proposal or a, a permit application that you stick to the permit application when you carry out your activity. Make sure your first couple of um, projects, you dot your I's and cross your T's through the whole process so that you get that confidence from your approval people. Uh, that I can't stress that enough. Uh, our overall goal uh, through our restoration is, um, and again, I'll zoom in a little bit to this photo. Um, and this is a simple site. This was just a, basically a fencing and tree planting site that we did. There was no hard armoring or bank armoring necessary here, but we take sites that look like, uh, you know, like the photo here on, on the left and in a couple of years, it looks like what's on the right. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, here's our uh, information on the wet water course wetland alteration permit. Uh, I think at this time too, it's important to state that um, 
consulting a local engineer um, is important, uh, especially if you feel like you're in over your head um, or if you have some technical questions um, or if your permitting branch uh, requires it, obviously, you may have to uh, include the consultation of a, a project engineer on the project. Obviously, this has cost implications and it does tend to all of a sudden make people feel a little bit intimidated or overwhelmed. Uh, I think if you talk uh, and create a relationship with those engineering people uh, or those consultants, that they are all going to step up and be willing to help you out as much as possible. Um, it takes some planning and advanced thought process though um, when you start to include um, engineering because to go after the funding for an engineering firm, uh, obviously you might need a little bit more money and the planning process tends to take a little longer when you have to engage that engineering aspect. Um, a lot of the projects that we do, we've been pretty fortunate. Again, I think that has to do with our history, but we have been able to avoid a lot of those costs because of you know we show good thought process, good process, uh, good methodologies, and that kind of thing, and we've shown good success in the past. Um, so we do talk a little bit about the the permitting process. Here's probably the key information under that is the link to the Wawa website, um, and we really encourage you to check that out. Um, especially if you're working in New Brunswick, get familiar with that, get comfortable with that, and don't be scared to reach out to those people at those at that branch either. I'm coming to the realization that, um, in a way, I kind of wish we could take live questions, Darla, but I, I think we might get inundated if I did, because I feel like I'm going through a lot of information here, folks, rather quickly, um, and I realize that I got about 10 to 15 minutes left. Um, so before we want to turn it over to questions, so again, write your questions down um, and I'll do my best to answer as many of them as I possibly can. Um, we thought it was important to, uh, to include as much information and linkages as possible, obviously, but silt fencing is something that <coughs> isn't always fully understood. Um, and we've done our best to try to encourage people or educate people as to how they can properly install a silt fence. Again, we've done our own diagrams here to try to keep it simple. Uh, you can see, you know, the fence stake to the inside, the, or the fence stake to the outside, the silt fence to the inside, the water line, uh, your fold and your backfill section of that silt fence. That's important. It's a pretty simple process, but for some people it can be intimidating. So we tried to simplify it as much as possible. For summer students or high school students coming right at, you know, first, second year university, the installation of a silt fence can be somewhat complicated or on, uh, an uncertainty for them. So this will make it a little bit easier for them. Again, just, you know, how do you look at it from the from the sky? If you get to put in two fences or two, two sections, how does that look type of thing? Even simple things like that can be intimidating if you're uncertain. So we're trying to remove some of that uncertainty around that. The materials required again is there and again more links uh, and videos for how to do it yourself type of thing installing rock toe um we've come to the realization bioengineering is great and, and soft approaches are really good but it's hard to do them and keep them successful if you can't stabilize that toe of your bank um, and we do a lot of rock toe installation again using the silt fence first making sure that we have a wetland and water course alteration permit in place and then we do a lot of rock toe uh, it's done in the dry. Um, we usually try not to touch the wetted portion of our channel with any of our excavators or any of our heavy equipment. Uh, the reason for that is, again, permitting. If I touch the wetted channel, it creates a whole different permitting aspect uh, versus if I can stay in the dry. Uh, so there's that information, and that's discussed within this as well. And again, you can see we just use a couple of diagrams to talk about you know, how we place the rock material, that kind of thing. Uh, materials required probably some of the the one of the things that gets overlooked a lot is your ppe uh, your personal protective equipment hard hats that kind of thing high visibility vests um, but even simple things like sunscreen bug sc bug spray uh, making sure that your uh, uh, contractor has spill kits on site that kind of thing as well is important erosion control blankets we talked about that and that's a new thing for us we've been we've been at that now for i guess a uh, new thing we've been at it for almost 10 years but uh, we're, we're now getting in the, to the point where our landowners and our stakeholders are confident in our installation of these control blankets uh, and they hold up and we've been able to show that they're holding up well under various uh, conditions. So people are now trusting us to come on and, and do these. Obviously with these kinds of installations, uh, it's a bit labor intensive. Um, it does require a bit more of our hands on, 
but we can also use volunteers a little bit easier than if I was just to do a hard arm or riprap job or I'm just putting the large boulders and rock in along the, the waterway. <clears throat> and so you can go through some of that again, just simple diagrams to show you kind of how it looks type of thing, how you would roll it out with our rock toe, our geo roll, one geo roll step, and then this the second one being prepped. And again, a video, uh, this is actually our video that uh, we created so that you can kind of see what it looks like when you put it in place. Brush layering is important as well. Um, one of those geo roll components or pardon me, one of those bioengineering components that we're now using a lot of. Um, and uh, I'm gonna move into a section here where it, uh, where we've, <laughs> we've left it in our restoration and we actually do some monitoring for our willow stock. Uh, so we actually go out and assess willow stands within our watershed to basically determine their applicability for harvesting for future willow stock and restoration work. Uh, because as we are, we're finding as we move more and more towards bioengineering approaches, we need to be aware of where available willow is. Uh, and it, it, some of it can be pretty demanding on the natural willow stocks that we have. What's really cool about some of the work that the KVRC is doing though is, as I said, we got started in 1994. Well, we've been planting willow almost since that time. We started, we planted our first willow in 1995. Those willows are now 30, 40 feet high, and they're offering up a lot of the material that we're using in some of our new restoration sites. So for us, that's that's a key. It might be, it might take your organization 20 years to get to that point. Uh, but in the meantime, you can just look for natural willow and native willow stock and try to get your, you know, the needed requirements there. You can see that this is pretty ex extensive site preparation, laying out the brush layer, how to put it in, that kind of thing. Again, you'll need your wetland and watercourse alteration permit. Pruning shears, lots of pruning shears, to be honest, you'll go through them in a hurry. So um, again, wattle fencing is another one of those bioengineering approaches. Um, we use it only in specific locations where the bank is already not necessarily eroding away, but just needs a little bit of vegetation and shade cover on our lower gradient streams uh, because uh, the wattle fencing creates a dam in back. So if you do get erosion behind the wattle fence, sometimes you create more problems than maybe what you'll solve. But they're great at creating a volunteer opportunity and great at creating some overhead, uh, overhead shade once the site matures. Uh, tree retments is also something that we've done. Um, we uh, These trees are not necessarily the ideal trees for tree revetments, but we had free stock coming off of a uh, um, a harvest site uh, that the town of Sussex had. Uh, so we took some of their trees uh, and this is what they provided. And we did some tree revetments to stabilize the bank there. Again, we talk a lot about what, what should be more ideal for trees, that kind of thing. Um, talk about anchoring systems, that kind of thing. Um, and this is what the site looked like. You can see here how the tree revetments are going to actually shore up this eroding stream bank here and, well, and help protect the trees that we planted in that floodplain as well. And again, lots of additional information. Uh, there's the willow stand inventory that I talked about. Um, and and uh, again, we left this, we toyed back and forth whether this should be in the monitoring section or within the restoration section. We left it within the restoration section because we felt that people were gonna scroll through this and looking for willow information. And there it is, there, it would be right there. Um, that might change. As I said, this is a living document and it may change. And there's the template for the willow stand, harvesting and installing willow stakes. This is a great volunteer event for us. Um, it is uh, obviously um, one of those things that we could have left up in the, uh, you know, the education outreach section. Uh, but again, it is, uh, we harvest these willow uh, and then propagate them to either willow seedlings or willow stakes or willow whips even. Um, and, but it is also one of those things that we can utilize volunteers to do. Uh, so we talk a little bit about that and some of the native willow stock that we have in New Brunswick. We always try to make sure that we're using native willow when possible. Uh, I will say that willow is very hybridized and sometimes very hard. And when you're using volunteers, uh, you can't be picky as to what they might harvest because they don't necessarily know all of the native stock and how to tell the differences between some of the hybrids as well. Um, but it is a good way to get some free in kind contribution and people love the fact that they can take a steak and cut the steak in the wintertime, come back out and do a willow planting event and then come back three or four years later and see that willow growing healthily along the riparian zone that they've helped restore. 
and that's just some of what that looks like after we do some staking and, and stuff like that. Uh, that's a dense staking area uh, on, a, on a kind of a clay loam. Willows don't tend to succeed overly well on clay loam, um, so we went fairly um, uh, dense there to hopefully, um, I guess, maximize our overall success on that site. That site's now looking, there's willow there now, four or five feet high, and that picture's only from about four years ago. Um, again, how to install a rock weir. We get into some of that. Really rock weirs, and I think there's a disclaimer um, here. Uh, you might want to consult an engineering consultant for this kind of work. You are going to be in the wetted portion of the stream, so we really think that uh, uh, consulting an engineer would be advantageous for groups just starting out for sure because there are different types of weirs there's mathematics and engineering to to consider uh when you're going through the design of your groin uh whether it's an attracting or, or deflecting groin or just even a stationary groin again some additional information using the dfo's uh, restoration manual um, and Department of Environment, Local Government's Wetland and Water Course Alteration Guidelines. Again, that's on there because we want each one to stand alone. So you might see that link three or four times. Um, one of the other things that we put in here was uh, how to select tree species for planting. Um, we had partnered with a group and had been talking with a group in the New Brunswick Environmental Network and through Nature MB, uh, and they kind of come up with this idea for us, thought it would be uh, um, helpful, and we agree fully especially given uh, there's some climate change um, references here as well. Um, and invasive pest species is something that we're concerned about here within our watershed. Uh, we know that we're going to be hit with emerald ash borer, for instance, in the next little bit. So we're probably going to uh, move away or steer away from planting ash, but what else can we plant in its place? Obviously here in New Brunswick, silver maple would be one of those good species, but what else, what other considerations do we need to look at? And this document helps us kind of make those choices and prioritize those choices. Uh, so when I go to my local nursery and say, hey, I need to buy this, this, and this, I have a good idea what it is that I need type of thing before I even start. So that's important. Again, climate change considerations. Uh, there's some information on that as well. And then the other resources is important. Um, one of the big things we do is install agriculture fencing. <laughs> the best piece of advice I can give you there, talk to your farmer. Um, they're going to dictate what and how you uh, install your fencing. Some farmers uh, like barbed wire and just want barbed wire. Uh, personally, we want, um, uh, we would prefer uh, electric fence because it's easier to deal with in the long term. If it's along a riparian zone and I got to take it out, um, I can take it out and put it in a lot easier than if it's a barbed wire fence. And just to scroll through quickly, there's just one of our restoration sites. That site's about 15 years old. Um, and you can see that we're working with an agriculture stakeholder and creating the riparian restoration there. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, to, again, diversify our funding, which is important. Um, and that meant that we looked at bird boxes, bee boxes, pollinator species, that kind of thing. So we also put some of that in here as well. Uh, again, that's all about improving your riparian zone. So we, we thought it was important to talk about some of that. Um, again, we've added some templates as to how we build some bird boxes and we use volunteers to build our bird boxes and install our bird boxes. We've created a Google map so that our volunteers can check on the Google map to see where their bird box might be. Uh, and when we do our maintenance on those boxes, uh, we try to, you know, add some photos, you know, if there's been some eggs in there, we make sure that we, you know, let people know that, hey, this box was successful type of thing. And that just creates a whole win-win scenario. Again, the people feel good about the work that we're doing and can more readily engage. Raptor platforms as well, we've done some of those. We've added some options as to how you can do that. I won't get into that, relevant of time. Brush piles is something else we've done. Drumming logs, again, to diversify our funding and to help with some of the wildlife trust fund money that we were looking to tap into. Rough grouse is a hunting uh, species, or a species that's hunted, obviously, and we wanted to tap into some of that money. Uh, so we did some drumming logs and some planting as well along improving uh, spruce grouse habitat. So we talk about that. Uh, again, duck boxes are important and bee boxes are important as well. And then lastly, um, the last one I'll get into, uh, because it is slightly important, is design and install a sign. I talked a little bit about how we've created a brand. Uh, we've also kind of come up with a unique way to do our signs. We dig a bigger hole than might be necessary. 
um, and it comes down to this section right here. We actually shove rebar through our four by four post in the bottom, bury it back in. What that prevents is people shaking this iron back and forth. They can no longer shake it and just pull it straight out. Uh, we found that if we just put in a four by four or six by six post, they'll actually start to shake it and pull it out. Our signs are, uh, um, again, all fairly similar in nature and texture. Uh, my kids can now, drive, as we're driving out the watershed, they'll see one of our signs. Hey, Dad, there's one of your signs. That's important. And you can see, too, um, on the sign, uh, there is acknowledgement of the funding partners. And then down here in the bottom, this is acknowledgement to the landowners that we work with on those sites. So I'm going to wrap it up there. Oh, we do have some other signage as well. Um, sign signage and, and or the si size of your signage can be important to consider as well. And landowner uh, approval of the sign is important as well. Oh, and don't forget your funding approval um, as well. So anyway, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to, Darla, if it's okay, I'm going to turn that over back over to you to maybe facilitate some questions. I went through a ton, guys. Uh, what I really want to stress is, is that um for each group it's a bit individual um but what we're trying to do here is take some of the intimidation factor away give you some templates give you some ideas uh give you a little bit of our experience on paper so that you can take this and kind of start to work down your own path but again you have to find your own way down river or up river um so i appreciate the opportunity appreciate you all listening and uh, i'm open for questions Ben, thank you so much. A lot of great information for, for everybody there. Um, so as Ben said, we're now going to have a question and answer session. So folks have a couple of options. Um, you can type in your question using the webinar control panel, which you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If it's minimized, just click on the arrow and that will open it up again and allow you to type in your question. You also have the option of raising your hand, figuratively speaking, if you, if you click on the hand icon, we'll know you wanna ask a question and I can unmute your microphone and you can ask it to Ben directly. So we'll give folks a few minutes to get their questions in, but I see we've already got a couple that have come in. So our first question comes from Robin uh, whole well, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Her question is, uh, is the manual available for viewing online or is there a fee to purchase it? So great question, it's not yet available online as I alluded to in the presentation. We're waiting for World Water Day on March 22nd and uh, we're going to uh, release it at that point online. Uh, we're just coming to the end of our AEI funding. It was a three year project um, to develop this and we developed it in, uh, uh, collaboration with some of those partner groups that I mentioned as well and uh, so now that the project is wrapped up we're going to release it with World Water Day and uh, do some you know promotion and that kind of thing and have it available then uh, it will be on our website we're going to post social media links so follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you like uh, and we're also going to be forwarding it through to Darla so she'll have a copy as well will Environment and Climate Change Canada how they distribute it, I'm not certain yet what their goal is with it, but they will have a copy of it there. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, the next question comes from Danielle Fiquette, uh, who uh, writes, what a great resource. Will the toolbox be available on your website after the launch? So yeah, so as I just stated, it, yeah. it will be available on our website after the launch. Um, and uh, once, it, once it's launched, it will be there. We'll try to work our best, uh, again, Given our resources and nonprofit, I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Um, right now, we have uh, we're pretty pretty good um, as far as our human resources go here. So we're I should be able to keep it up to date and add a few other things. Or we've already identified a couple of things that we want to add in there just through talking to other groups and seeing some of the partner groups and their feedback. We're, we're thinking, oh, well, let's add this in. So at times we're going to update it, but it will be available after the launch on March 22nd through our website. Thank you, Ben. Okay, the next question comes from Peter Murphy, uh, who writes, Ben, terrific presentation. Unfortunately, I couldn't log into the first 15 minutes due to technical issues. Uh, will your full presentation be available online? I... The answer to yeah, that is... Go ahead, Daryl, if you like. Um, so we are in the process of recording it, and I will be posting it to YouTube as soon as it's finished processing. So it will be on our usual YouTube page probably in a couple of hours. Wow, that's fast, Darla. I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with the fact that you're done at the end of the day? 
<laughs> and yes, as Ben just alluded to, this is going to be my final webinar. Um, so my last one here in the series, I'm ending with a bang with Ben. Um, Charlene uh, McCoy is going to be taking over my position and the series. And so uh, the, the series uh, for 2021, 2022 will be announced in the summer as usual and restarting again in the fall. Uh, so we have a couple of question, questions that have also come in. Carolee McCaskill writes, just a quick note to say thank you for creating this. Oh, you're welcome. Um, the next one comes from Jessica Chan, who asks, how applicable is the toolbox to restoration projects outside New Brunswick? We feel it's still quite uh, replicable uh, outside the province of New Brunswick. Uh, you know, you have to be cognizant of your stream type, um, bedrock geology and all that isn't, is, is figured into a lot of the work that we do. So you'll have to do that on a site-by-site -site assessment. But the typical overall process that we followed to, from, you know, kind of designing the project and engaging the landowners down to the actual putting the rocks on the ground or the, the geo roll in, into place, uh, that process doesn't change a whole lot from one jurisdiction to the next. Uh, as I alluded to in the presentation, the one thing that you do have to be aware of is your permitting bodies and knowing where to go to get those permits and make sure you understand the, that process before you dig too deep into your stream side or anything like that. Thank you. Uh, we have another comment from Terry Melanson who says, congratulations, Ben, on being a leader in watershed management and for developing this manual. I am sure that it will be a useful tool to other watershed groups. Thanks, Terry. Uh, really appreciate your support through this process. It's it's been uh, been a bit long coming for us actually, and 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 honestly, it took me a little longer to put this out than I was hoping, but it is here and, and it is available now. So thanks. Great. Well, I think that's the last of our comments and our questions. So I'll say another huge thank you to Ben. We really appreciate you being willing to give this this presentation and to share this tool with everyone. I think it's going to be a great resource. Thanks, Darla. I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you guys today and I hope everybody's happy and healthy right now. So exactly. Yes. Um, and so this is the last webinar in the series for this year. And as I as I noted, uh, the series will be starting up again in the fall with uh, Sherilyn McCoy. OK, thanks, everybody. And I hope you'll be able to join us again soon. Take care. Stay safe and healthy. Thanks,